Hello, good evening students. So, I'll be discussing a few doubts of oral pathology that have been put up by all. Now, uh, let's start with the first one. Uh, one student was asking, what are the types of antibodies found in pemphigoid and pemphigus? There was a little confusion regarding that. So, to understand that, first of all, I'm sure you all are aware of uh, the nature of these two skin conditions pemphigus and uh, pemphigus vulgaris particularly and pemphigoid now uh, to understand how this disease occurs we know it's an autoimmune disease but exactly what happens and how are these auto antibodies formed so basically it's, since it's autoimmune there are going to be the formation of auto antibodies or antibodies against your own system so now where are these auto antibodies formed and where do they act that differs in these two conditions so to understand that so this diagram is showing you the different skin levels so um, you have also drawn these diagrams in your uh, pathology cl uh, classes where you can uh, divide it so the outer layer of skin is the epidermis and these ep this epidermis has multiple layers we have the stratum corneum granulosum the spinosum and then the basal cell layer which is attached to the basement membrane and this basement membrane zone consists of the lamina lucida densa and sublamina densa so this will be the dermal and Epith epidermal junction as well so the epidermis with these layers then the basement membrane attachment or the dermal epidermal junction and then finally underneath is the dermis so um as you can see, it's very nicely shown how diff each of these conditions have their effects at different skin levels. So when we talk about acting only on the epidermis, pemphigus foliaceous is a type of pemphigus wherein the antibodies are for formed in the superficial epidermis. So mainly in the corneum and granulosum. Whereas pemphigus vulgaris is uh, the antibodies uh, are formed in the lower epidermis, mainly the spinous layer. Whereas in pemphigoid, they act much lower down in the subepidermal or at either at the junction or subepidermal. So anything below the epidermis. So here you can see. Uh, we all know that these epithelial cells that are seen in this image, there will be attachments between these epithelial cells and these attachments are known as desmosomes. And the attachment of the epithelial cell to the basement membrane or the basal layer will be called a hemidesmosome. So in normal skin, you can see these attachments are intact. So the desmosomes which are seen in uh, green and the hemidesmosomes which is the attachment of the basal cells to the basement membrane. Now in pemphigus vulgaris what happens there are antibodies which are formed against the desmosomal protein so desmoglein 1 and 3 that is why what happens there is something known as acantholysis or this desmosomes or these junctions which are connecting the epithelial cells together this junction gets completely eroded or it will get disintegrated which is why there will be complete separation of the epithelial cells or loss of attachments of the epithelial cells which is called as acantholysis and that is the reason why in pemphigus there is something called the Nikolsky sign which happens because why because when you rub your skin it gets easily sheared away because the complete epithelial cell attachments with each other the epidermal cells it's lost whereas in pemphigoid what you will see is antibodies against the hemidesmosome so it's not as high up as pemphigus it's formed at the hemidesmosome or at this junction because of which what happens there will be a separation of the basement membrane from the remainder of the cell. So, the epidermis and dermis get separated. Now, looking at these two images, you can understand why in pemphigus, the blisters or the uh, bullae which are seen, they are quite superficial. They are... Um, easily they get eroded because they are at the epidermis. There will be a positive Nikolsky sign as well. Whereas, and in the smear when you take, you will very clearly see acantholysis and the attachment of the base, basal cells to the membrane is still intact. Only the cells above are disintegrated. So, because this attachment will be intact, it will appear to be like a tombstone appearance on the histopathological examination. Whereas in pemphigoid, the blisters which you see, they will be quite deep and the Nikolsky sign will not be positive. So, I hope you all understood this. So, uh, just what I explained only in a flowchart form. So, what happens in pemphigus, like I said, the autoantibodies or the um, 
uh, antibodies against the desmosomes are found so that is desmoglein so there's development of auto antibodies against the intercellular epidermal antigens so there will be auto antibodies formed in the epidermis separating the attachments of these cells to one another loss of intercellular connections will occur and even any minute shearing forces will shear off the epidermis because you can see this is the normal skin the normal attachment and here because of the auto antibody formation these attachments are lost and hence you will see the nikolsky sign and the vesicles and bullae will be very friable thin and the um, they'll be quite superficial as compared to pemphigoid. So this is much more severe as compared to pemphigoid. Whereas in like you can see in pemphigoid, the antibodies are formed much lower down in the um, uh, skin against the basement membrane antigens that is BPAG1 and BPAG2 against these uh, antigens the antibodies are formed which will activate the complement system and any uh, uh, activation of complement will result in uh, in growth of inflammatory cells and autoimmune destruction of the basement membrane so the adhesion between the epidermis and dermis this area will get completely weak because the hemidesmosomes or the attachment of the cells to basement membrane is lost and due to this what happens when that attachment gets lost so normally they should be one above the other but because the attachment is lost there will be formation of kind of a dead space or uh, empty space which will get filled up with inflammatory fluid and this will form a pseudo pocket and accumulation of serous fluids which will be called a serous filled bullae so this is what happens in a pemphigoid so don't get confused between the two the antibodies are formed against desmoglein 1 and 3 in pemphigus in foliaceous it's more superficial in the corneum uh, in uh, vulgaris it's a little uh, below that but still it is only in the epidermis so there will be a supra basilar split whereas in pemphigoid the antibodies are formed against the hemidesmosomes and the epidermal dermal junction will get lost so the bullae are much deeper there will be formation of these pockets uh, not as severe as pemphigus since they are a little deeper and uh, it will be formed much lower so there will be a sub basilar split now uh, now that you've understood the different uh, pathogenesis and pathophysiology of pemphigus and pemphigoid the question asked here is the primary cause of acantholysis in pemphigus vulgaris is now um, most of you all would immediately go for option b which is intercellular edema which is absolutely correct the intercellular edema which is uh, dis uh, due to disruption of the desmosomes there will be formation of edema and acantholysis but keep in mind here they have asked primary cause and the primary cause is what the formation of these auto antibodies to the desmoglein 1 and 3 so that is it the autoimmunity which is actually causing it this autoimmunity will cause the edema and the formation of this uh, acantholysis and supra basilar split so the primary cause the right answer would be option a or autoimmunity intercellular edema is the next step but the main cause is the autoantibodies uh, now a little bit about nasoalveolar cyst someone had a doubt uh, regarding the radiographic appearance of a nasoalveolar cyst now <clears throat> the nasoalveolar cyst is nothing but our nasolabial cyst or the cleidstat cyst so these are the two other names of this cyst and this uh, cyst is two things to remember it is non-odontogenic uh, it is not formed from uh, any of the tooth forming structures unlike dentigerous or OKC it is a non-odontogenic cyst we all are aware there is something known as the nasolacrimal duct which runs from the lacrimal apparatus and into the inferior meatus of the nose now during the formation of this duct what happens we all know in embryology we have our maxillary processes which are growing inwards and it's going to fuse with the median nasal and the lateral nasal process here which is a part of our frontonasal process so during the process of this fusion some cells will hollow out and form this duct but sometimes some cells may get entrapped within the remnants of the duct or during the fusion some epithelial cells may get entrapped this entrapment might form this nasolabial cyst so it is a developmental cyst because it is formed during the process of embryology or development
that is during embryogenesis so it is a non odontogenic it is developmental and this cyst is unlike dentigerous it is not formed within the bone it is on the soft tissue it will be located on the maxilla but not within the bone so it is a soft tissue cyst it is in the soft tissues and it is extra osseous it is not within bone so it is extra osseous unlike the nasopalatine cyst which will be within the palatal bone this one is not within the bone so it will be a soft tissue or an extra osseous cyst now it is a relatively uh, rare cyst not very commonly seen and this cyst is not a very painful or any uh, a problematic cyst but it will mainly cause as you can see clinically a soft tissue swelling will be appreciated extraorally you can see that where the cyst is located there will be a kind of fullness uh in that side of the face a mild swelling the nasolabial fold will get obliterated and the ala of the nose will get lifted up and intraorally it will appear like a small soft tissue mass usually it's quite painless only if it gets infected it will result in pain so um now when we talk about the radiograph which was the main doubt you have to understand that since this is a soft tissue cyst you won't be able to appreciate it very well on an opg or an iopa or an occlusal which we normally take in our practice because that is mainly to see intraosseous cysts which are in bone or they will be very well appreciated because only hard tissues can be appreciated well in these radiographs but this is a soft tissue cyst so it's not very helpful in an opg or a iopa usually the best bet in such a case would be in this image the second one which i'm showing you in an mri you will be able to see it very well because mri shows the soft tissues very well or in a contrast ct scan you will be able to appreciate it in an opg or iopa it's not usually seen very well if it is seen it usually appears like a Uh, between the lateral incisor and canine you can understand the location of this cyst in this image you can see this is the nasoalveolar or the nasolabial cyst at the location since it's going to form at the point of entrapment while forming this nasolacrimal duct intraorally it's usually present between the lateral incisor and canine now uh, do not get confused um with the globulo maxillary cyst that is also between the lateral incisor and canine but that is going to appear like an inverted pair this one also appears quite similar to that but it could either be a funnel shaped or a pear shaped radiolucency so if it is present they both look very similar but do not get confused you have to go for an aspiration and go for a ct and mri for further investigations another radiolucency which is uh, something which is seen between the maxillary central incisors as a heart shaped radiolucency is our nasopalatine duct cyst so that is also another um, thing which you can get confused with so just remember it appears like a pear shaped or a funnel shaped radiolucency between the lateral incisor and canine and that is very similar to a globulo maxillary cyst but this one is a soft tissue cyst so we should never really make a diagnosis just looking at an opg like this case is the same case i showed you in these images but here you can't really appreciate any good um, cystic details so in a nasolabial cyst it's always better to go for an mri or a contrast ct now the next question is clinical features of which of the following include conjunctivitis urethritis mucocutaneous lesions and arthritis so let's take it option by option so the first one i have spoken about is we can easily rule out option c grinspan syndrome we all know is a triad of hypertension diabetes and oral lichen planus there is no conjunctivitis or any um, arthritis or these conditions so it can be ruled out so this is option c is out ehlers danlos syndrome is a syndrome in which the main features of it are hyper extensibility of skin as you know uh, the characteristic stretchable skin which is known as the circus rubber man appearance because of uh, collagen defects the joints are hyper mobile because of which the patient will have recurrent dislocations of the joint including tmj dislocations and because of this abnormal stretchable or hyper extensible skin and joints there's a very high chance of easy bruising formation of petechiae hemorrhages aneurysms so all of these are the main features of ehlers danlos syndrome it's very difficult to do suturing suturing should not be attempted in these cases because 
um the skin is not amenable to the passage of the needle and suture material so ehlers danlos syndrome can be ruled out there as um, it does not uh, correlate with the question the next option was lymphoma hodgkins lymphoma now you all know lymphoma is a type of cancer which originates from the lymphocytes which are our white blood cells so abnormal proliferation of these lymphocytes and uh, which will lodge in different lymph nodes so mainly uh, all the constitutional symptoms of cancer will be seen in such conditions we all know it um is highly associated with the epstein bar virus or a patient suffering from full blown aids so uh, mainly there will be a painless rubbery enlargement of the lymph nodes mainly of the axilla um you have the cervical nodes supraclavicular lymph nodes uh, histologically there will be reed sternberg cells and other symptoms of cancer like weight loss decreased appetite cough fevers night sweats so all of these are cancer like symptoms so these are all the symptoms and signs which you can see so that also can be ruled out so since we have eliminated the three options the only option remaining is the bechet syndrome so this is obviously the right answer so bechet syndrome is a disease in which there's chronic vasculitis and inflammation of all the small and large blood vessels along with recurrent oral and genital ulcers and uveitis so you can see recurrent oral and genital ulcers along with arthritis painful muscles and eye changes like uveitis so basically it causes vasculitis of all the blood vessels and this will result in uveitis along with that there will be skin lesions and many other such um, uh, symptoms of vasculitis so this covers all the questions which are so conjunctivitis urethritis along with mucocutaneous lesions and arthritis so the most correct answer here would be option a or bechet syndrome if bechet syndrome was not there in the options there's another syndrome which uh, was asked which a student had a doubt with very well uh, thought out that these symptoms which are uh, mentioned in the mcq correlates very well with the reiter syndrome reiter syndrome is also known as reactive arthritis it has a typical triad of arthritis urethritis and conjunctivitis along with mucocutaneous diseases this uh, condition is very commonly seen uh, in people who have just recovered from a very severe gastrointestinal infection like uh, infection with salmonella typhi shigella uh, clostridium difficile uh, all of these really um, um dangerous bacteria which can cause very severe gastrointestinal infections due to some abnormal autoimmunity which can occur after recovery from this infection some sort of aberrant uh, immunity occurs where an auto antibodies are again formed and around 2 weeks after recovery they develop this sudden arthritis urethritis and conjunctivitis so uh, this is known as reiter syndrome which is actually the best correlation with this question but since it's not mentioned in the um, options it's bechet syndrome but just keep it in mind there's another syndrome which correlates here known as the reiter syndrome or reactive arthritis okay next question is dental anomaly of teeth associated with defective bone formation now remember here they have specifically mentioned it affects teeth along with bone so your first option amelogenesis imperfecta is again a rare um developmental disorder which is going to affect the process of amelogenesis or enamel formation because of which the teeth which are formed are unusually you can see in this diagram they are small there'll be pits fissures they'll be abnormally stained and they'll rapidly wear and break because of the abnormal enamel formation the teeth will be very sensitive and uh, there will be a lot of abnormalities pertaining to the teeth only it does not have any role in bone formation it is only involving the teeth so it can be eliminated now the option c odontodysplasia is nothing but our ghost teeth appearance which is again an abnormal uh, developmental disorder wherein what happens is the teeth which are formed 
are extremely small so they are like microdontia you can see they have extremely short roots very large pulp chambers and the poor mineralization of the enamel and dentine gives them a ghost teeth type appearance and in most of the cases because of the short roots the teeth are very mobile either they will erupt and immediately exfoliate or they will be missing from the arches so this is again a condition which only affects the teeth and does not really uh, affect the bone formation so that can also be eliminated now we are left with option b and option d that is dentinogenesis imperfecta and osteitis deformans which is pagets now in both these conditions so di we all know shields has classified it into type 1 type 2 and type 3 now in type 1 this osteogenesis imperfecta also occurs along with dentinogenesis imperfecta so osteogenesis imperfecta is some, something which is going to affect our bone formation and it will result in um, abnormal and brittle bones so osteogenesis imperfecta with di that is type 1 di is also very well pertaining to this question dental anomaly of teeth along with defective bone formation so type 1 di type 1 di does have anomaly of teeth as well as bone so it's going to affect the teeth the teeth are going to be abnormally colored they'll be opalescent and uh, they'll be either obliterated pulp chambers or um, formation of pulp stones so yes there is anomaly of teeth and plus osteogenesis imperfecta if present it will have defective bone formation as well but even d that is osteitis deformans or pagets disease which is something it affects bone remodeling because of which the bones which are formed are extremely deformed they are brittle they are vascularized weak and they um, are abnormally shaped so it uh, also affects bone formation there's excessive bone resorption abnormal bone remodeling because of which what happens is that the vault of skull is affected that there's narrowing of the foramina leading to cranial nerve deficits there's a lion face appearance due to extensively enlarged jaws and along with that the teeth are also affected there is hyper cementosis of the teeth there'll be ankylosed teeth uh, severe bleeding and osteomyelitis so technically speaking in this question even osteogenesis imperfecta is affecting teeth as well as bone and di is also affecting teeth as well as bone so i would say that both b and d are correct though the answer was given as b if you think about it both b and d are going to be an anomaly of teeth and associated with defective bone formation the next question uh, about osteogenesis imperfecta so they so you basically have to um, answer which one among these best suits this condition now uh, option a can be eliminated because it is not a sex linked disorder it is an autosomal dominant disorder so a can be removed it has association with amelogenesis uh, so basically we all know osteogenesis imperfecta has association with dentinogenesis imperfecta so we can remove option d as well now um, since this condition uh, basically causes mutations in these COL1A1 and A2 genes which produce type 1 collagen. Now type 1 collagen is a very important uh, protein which uh, is deposited in various areas of our body and they uh, provide structural integrity and strength. So it's very essential not just in the bones but in the joints, the ligaments, the cornea, the ear canal. Uh, different bones so uh, like i said over 80 percent of the mutations are autosomal dominant and due to abnormality of type 1 collagen the bones which are formed are extremely brittle and they break easily because of the abnormality of the scleral collagen because this collagen one is abnormal or missing the reflective qualities of the light are affected so there will be something known as the blue sclera the teeth will be brittle the uh, pulp chambers will be abnormal because of the collagen abnormality so many areas or many uh, different joints and ligaments will get affected along with that uh, in our, around 90 percent of the cases because of abnormality of this type 1 collagen there will be a lot of middle and internal ear defects because of which by the time the patient turns 20 to 30 there will be severe hearing loss so deafness is also seen in this 
uh, osteogenesis imperfecta so coming to option c it may be associated with deafness is correct now b is mentioning manifests as blue sclera which is pathognomonic of this disease pathognomonic basically means that it is only seen in this and it is not seen in any other disease but blue sclera can also be seen in other conditions like glaucoma ehlers danlos syndrome marfan syndrome scleritis so it's not pathognomonic of osteogenesis imperfecta it can be also seen in other diseases so b is not totally correct so i would say option c may be associated with deafness is the most correct answer it does have blue sclera but it is not pathognomonic it can also be seen in other conditions so it's between b and c and c would be the more appropriate answer now uh, coming to the next question the disorder characterized by cranio synostrosis cranio facial anomalies symmetrical syndactyly of the hands and feet and polysyndactyly now syndactyly basically means fusion i'm sure you all are aware of that now what is cranio synostrosis mean so we all know this is this center image is of our normal skull this is how the our normal the normal head is shaped this is the normal shape of the head we all know that the bones of the cranial vault are separated by sutures which fuse later and form the bones but what happens is that if these sutures fuse too soon or early or premature fusion so premature fusion of these sutures will cause something known as cranio synostrosis now we all know we have was the coronal suture which runs from one uh, ear we can from one helix to the other the coronal suture we have the metopic suture um, which divides the frontal bone we have the sagittal suture and finally on the occipital region on the back of the head we have the lambdoidal suture so what would happen you can also um, visualize that if your metopic suture fuses very early the head will not be shaped like this it will it will be shaped like this because the suture has fused too early so it will cause something known as trigonocephaly you can see here due to the abnormal or early fusion of the metopic suture similarly due to abnormal fusion of the coronal suture what will happen instead of having this ovoid shape the head will become short and rounded due to early fusion of the coronal suture which is called brachycephaly similarly you have the early fusion of sagittal suture which will cause something called scaphocephaly or a boat shaped head you will have the plagiocephaly so there will be lots of so all of these things i'm speaking about is what is called as cranio synostrosis now among these we can remove down syndrome we know that uh, we know the different uh, signs of down syndrome and these are not present so we can remove down syndrome so the question arises between three these three now all these three syndromes will have cranio synostrosis and cranio facial anomalies but this syndactyly that is fusion of the fingers of the hands and the toes is not seen in cruzon syndrome in cruzon we only have cranio synostrosis so we can remove cruzon now the question arises between carpenter syndrome and apert syndrome now this diagram will be able to explain it well so apert syndrome uh, you can see the cranio synostrosis syndromes are mentioned here very well we have the apert syndrome which mainly occurs due to the cranio synostrosis of the bicoronal suture which i spoke about here because of that that will cause the apert syndrome as well as cruzon syndrome in carpenter syndrome what happens it's multiple cranio synostrosis not only of the coronal suture but of many so something like this may be or due to a combination of all these three along with that we have the fifer syndrome and the chodzin syndrome now which cranio synostrosis syndrome has normal intelligence cruzon and which one has normal hands cruzon so there is no syndactyly in cruzon so we can eliminate it now among those these two technically there's quite they are almost the same carpenter and apert will both have this mitten hands and sock feet appearance due to syndactyly but apert syndrome only mainly involves the coronal suture whereas carpenter is multiple there will be multiple cranio synostrosis and apert will mainly cause the syndactyly of the hands and feet not much of the soft tissues so among these two i would say looking at all the signs and symptoms 
even though they are quite similar and they are overlapping option a or carpenter syndrome would be more appropriate because it has much more and multiple craniosynostosis as compared to upward which only has coronal so i hope that among these two it's clear that carpenter syndrome would be the more appropriate choice